Kalo for Lava, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Koroi Hawkins. Coming up. The vote came out as expected, the majority for the government and the minority for the opposition. Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister defeats a motion of no confidence. Also... The crisis in New Caledonia is reverberating at the political level. We examine a recent political shift in New Caledonia's Congress and later on, league fans strap in for the first finals footy weekend. The Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, James Marape, has easily defeated a vote of no confidence brought by the opposition. The vote at the beginning of the Thursday sitting day came after the opposition had previously struggled to get their motion into the House. The Speaker, Job Pomat, allowed it to go ahead but denied opposition MPs the opportunity to talk to it. Don Wiseman spoke with RNZ Pacific's PNG correspondent Scott Mwaide, who was at the Parliament in Port Moresby. It was expected pretty much both by the government and the opposition and the debate, the the controversy that happened in the morning was so that the opposition would use the opportunity to debate after the motion was introduced by the opposition leader to express their dissatisfaction with the government. And unfortunately, that didn't happen with the speaker disallowing the debate. So they proceeded to the vote and the vote came out as expected, the majority for the government and the minority for the opposition. So what were the results of the vote? Yeah. So the vote results were 75 for James Marape and 32 for Rainbow Piper. So a resounding victory after all of this. Yes, a resounding victory, but James Marape has to prove, now that he has another opportunity at at, uh, managing government, that he has the political will and the stamina to address, one, the corruption within his own government, allegations of corruption within his own government, the issues of health, education, the increase in crime rates that we've seen in the last uh, 24 months, as well as the inflation that we're seeing in the economy, the rising cost of goods and services, and the generally the economy. Well, those were the issues that were supposedly driving the opposition, but because they didn't manage to discuss them in public, the Prime Minister has essentially been left completely off the hook, hasn't he? Yeah, it's been difficult for the opposition to bring those issues to Parliament without getting interrupted. And I think within government caucuses, uh, a lot of MPs have expressed they haven't been able to fully express what they've been talking about and what they've been thinking about, what what the public has uh, expressed to them, and be able to get the results that they want to see happen. So that's been frustrating for them as opposition MPs has, have expressed. All right, so what happens now? We can expect a continuous series of votes of no confidence through next year as well, can't we? Because this window that exists within the PNG parliamentary system, which allows votes of no confidence, it will close, I think, in a year or so, won't it? Yes, and that, that was the statement off microphone, of course, that uh, the member for Medang, Brian Kramer, said uh, it's not the end, this is just round one, he said. So there's a high likelihood that the opposition may bring about another vote of no confidence, although it's highly unlikely in the next few months, but there's a, still a possibility of a vote of no confidence. And, and depending on the issues, again, and depending also on their resources and their ability to muster the numbers and bring the numbers to the floor of parliament and cause a vote to happen. What has been the public reaction to all of this carry on by the politicians? I see that uh, one of the local newspapers has been running a series of satirical stories, I think on its front page or close to, uh, on the attempts by various politicians to change the guard and so on and so on. But what do the general public think of it all? Yeah, there's, there's a general feeling of weariness that, OK, let's get the vote over and get on with it. Let's fix the issues that uh, really affecting ordinary Papua New Guineans. Let's not fight about the power. Let's get together. And that sentiment was pretty much expressed in Parliament after the vote with the opposition leader calling for a bipartisan approach to problem solving and the Prime Minister himself talking also about the abuse of Section 145. Section 145, of course, is the section in the Constitution that allows for votes of no confidence. Yes, yes. 
that, that's uh, section 145 is the provision for the vote of no confidence. So, yeah, generally there's a feeling of weariness both inside parliament and that's been expressed by various parties and, and also outside with, with a lot of people viewing the moves back and forth by MPs to government and to opposition as presenting an element of self-interest, you know, not really representing how the people feel. There's been a major political shift in New Caledonia's Congress in recent weeks amid ongoing unrest in the troubled French territory. The pro-independence president of New Caledonia's Congress, Rock Wamitan, has been ousted by Velma Faleo from the king-making Oceania Awakening Party, with massive support for her candidacy coming from the anti-independence parties. On top of this, rifts within both pro- and anti-independence camps continue and Paris has selected a prime minister who's publicly voiced strong views around the territory remaining with France. I spoke with senior Pacific journalist and islands business correspondent Nick McClellan about some of these changes and began by asking what Pacific Islands forum leaders decided to do about a proposed visit to New Caledonia at their recent summit in Tonga. After some delay uh, before the forum, in approving a, a monitoring mission to go to New Caledonia, um, led by uh, the so-called Forum Troika, that's the past, present and future chairs of the forum, um, agreement was finally reached in uh, Nukulofa on the sidelines of the official leaders' meeting. Um, the forum is looking for dates where four leaders can travel to New Caledonia. Prime Minister Sidveni Rambuka of Fiji, uh, Mark Brown of the Cook Islands, Siosi Sobeleni of Tonga, and next year's Forum Chair, Jeremiah Manelli of Solomon Islands, backed by uh, Forum Secretariat staff. The mission would be in a long line of uh, missions sent by um, the Forum, ministerial and officials, to monitor um, elections and referendums in New Caledonia. So there's been a long tradition ever since the 1980s that forum ministers at a diplomatic level will go on the ground um, to find out what's going on, to talk to everyone, the French uh, authorities, the French High Commission, uh, the government of New Caledonia, um, and key political parties, whether supporters or opponents of independence. This is a really high-level mission, though. It's very rare that four prime ministers would travel together. Um, And that shows, I think, the concern that the forum uh, has as a collective body about the crisis in New Caledonia, which is certainly not over yet. In New Caledonia itself, quite a lot of movement in in multiple um, areas. The most significant um, politically, though, Roch Wamitan um, losing his seat in the uh, as the president president of the Congress. Tell us about that and also the the new president and what what that could mean for the whole situation in New Caledonia. The crisis in New Caledonia since the 13th of May, with enormous economic, political, cultural, social impacts, is reverberating at the political level. And we've seen um, on both sides of politics, um, on all sides of politics, significant long-standing issues coming to a head. Um, As you say, the Congress of New Caledonia, the 54-member parliament legislature for the the islands, has been led for a number of years by uh, Rock Wamitan, a veteran politician, a pro-independence leader, one of the signatories of the 1998 Namir Accord, and, um, you know, a a leader who held the position for five years in a row, re-elected every year, based on a so-called Islander majority um, alongside the two pro-independence parliamentary groups within the Congress, there is a small um, uh, representation from Eve Oceanien, uh, the Pacific Awakening Party, which is uh, has support particularly from the Walesian community, Futunan community, and Tahitians and other islanders. They only hold three seats in the Congress, but given the balance between pro- and anti-independence parties, They've been kingmakers, Um, and so this uh, link between Kanak and Islanders has um, seen Rock Wamiton return several times to the presidency, what we might call in English the speaker's position. Um, And it's an important position because it allows liaison with uh, parliaments around the region, 
it um, determines memberships of committees within the parliamentary system and so on. So it's a, a key role. Basically, it got cooed. Um, if <laughs> uh, and switched their three votes away from the independence bloc and uh, in turn won the position themselves with backing of the anti-independence parties. So Velma Faliolo, uh, a Walesian politician, a New Caledonian of Walesian heritage, uh, has taken the position the first time a woman has ever held the presidency of the Congress. Uh, it's a significant change. It's just shot across the bowels of the independence movement because uh, many uh, uh, Walesians are pretty poor, um, some living in squatter settlements, uh, they're working people generally, and the economic impact of the crisis has really hit them hard. I think there's a great concern about the damage to the economy, the loss of jobs, um, and the you know clashes between protesters and police that has contributed to this uh, significant shift. It also sets a worrying um, message to President Louis Mapu, the president of the government of New Caledonia rather than the parliament. Um, president Mapu once again holds uh, his uh, leadership of the 11-member government um, with a vote from uh, the Eveo Sienin Party at uh, 6-5 in the government. And um, the possibility that in coming uh, weeks or months, um, the government might be destabilised by a similar shift um, is on the cards. And, uh, you know, President Mapu is reaping the, the mess that has been created by French President Macron as the you know, president of New Caledonia, he's the guy who's going to get blamed for all the economic turmoil and damage that's been caused over recent months. The involvement of former New Zealand Governor-General Sir Jerry Mataparai in leading the Bougainville Peace Monitoring Group is the key factor in him being brought in as a moderator to try and solve an impasse over the region's push for independence. That's the view of Bougainville's Minister for Independence Implementation, Ezekiel Massat, who says he chose Sir Jerry along with Papua New Guinea's Minister of Bougainville Affairs, Manasi Makimba. Both governments have been at loggerheads over the tabling in the PNG Parliament of the results from the independence referendum. PNG wants it to decide by an absolute majority, while Bougainville says it should be just a simple majority of MPs. Don Wiseman spoke with Mr Massat. Let me start by uh, saying the appointment of Sir Jerry was a consensus appointment. There was very little uh, arguments. We had narrowed down the list from about about 10 to 15. But when it came to the last three, uh, Sir Jerry was the uh, one that uh, myself and Minister Makiba were able to agree very quickly on. The other three candidates also came with... Uh, a wealth of experience. But I think in the end, what swayed both myself and Minister Makiba was the fact that Sir Jerry had uh, served in some capacity uh, here in Bougainville. And uh, we were insistent that any candidate on the uh, moderator's position is one that that would understand not only what the relevant agreements are, but particularly the uh, context of the Bougainville uh, uh, situation. Uh, It now means we can move forward, Don. There are some administrative arrangements being uh, attended to in terms of informing and finding out what sort of timetable uh, Sir Jerry is on. I'm, I'm aware that he's available when his application was launched, and I assume that he will be ready to, to commence work as soon as possible. What is it that you particularly require from him? Well, you know, the arguments, some of the aspects of the impasse, the arguments is not necessarily on what, what the literal uh, meaning of the agreement is. It's more contextual. And I think it's from that, that particular aspect uh, that we think uh, uh, Sir Jerry would be a plus. I don't know whether he's a lawyer or not, but he'll have uh, legal advice, no doubt. It's not going to be a one-man show. Uh, it's not going to be Sir Jerry attempting to resolve all these things. We had uh, explicitly agreed on resource people uh, working with him. And the primary purpose is not only to resolve the impasse, but it's also to make sure that the members of the National Parliament, Parliament are fully conversant on, on the Bougainville situation. So, so whilst the... Uh, the terms of reference for Sir Jerry might appear to be limited. Uh, if you read the uh, the joint statement from the Prime Minister and the President, you would 
you would see that uh, it's it's quite an expensive uh, role that uh, he's required to play. So in terms of, say, informing the, the MPs in the PNG Parliament, how does he go about that? Will he speak to Parliament directly? No, not necessarily. There is a bipartisan committee that still needs to be set up. And uh, uh, what we anticipate is for the bipartisan to be working with uh, Sir Jerry's uh, office. We also anticipate Sir Jerry to be getting resource people to come in and have uh, workshops and seminars with the members and uh, anybody that matters. So I don't anticipate the uh, moderator to be personally attending to all these tasks. I think there are relevant uh, resource people who he can utilise on this agenda. And when we talk about the impasse, it's this debate over whether it should be a simple or an absolute vote by MPs on the tabling. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct, yeah. Okay. So when do you think it will be resolved now? I stand ready to brief Ted Jerry as soon as he commences his uh, responsibility. I have no uh, indications of when that timeline might be. I have no indications when he gets into the country. But the uh, intention is uh, when he commences work that myself and Minister Makiba would be in a position to provide a briefing to him and argue our case. And then uh, he can take it from there. And then there were eight. NRL Finals Week 1 kicks off on Friday night in Penrith. Christina Persico previews the action. It's another minor premiership for Melbourne, who took the regular season honours with two rounds to spare. But the obstacles in their way to another championship include three-time defending premiers Penrith, who get back their X-factor Nathan Cleary in time for the finals. The Panthers will play Sydney in their first playoff match on Friday night. Former Panther Josh Mansour warns not to write off the Roosters, though. You know, the Roosters have got to prepare, be prepared for an ambush mm. performance on, with the Panthers and this game reminds me of that 2020 first preliminary final when uh, we just beat them um, in the end and uh, yeah, I know everyone's riding off the Roosters with all those injuries but you definitely can't take them lightly and, but yeah, with Nathan's inclusion this side, that's definitely a big boost. Then on Saturday afternoon in Melbourne, the minor premiers The Storm will face the Sharks. Melbourne captain Harry Grant says you can't look too far ahead. Well, I guess we weren't there at the start of the year, so the outside noise has probably changed a little bit if if that's the case, that we're the favourites. But we're pretty lucky down here in Melbourne. We're pretty sheltered from that. And, you know, what's important to us is is what's internal and inside our four walls. And, you know, we don't really need to look into that. It's um, finals footy and NRL, anyone can beat anyone on their day. So it's just important we turn up each week we're playing with the right mindset, play the right footy and that's all we can ask for. Saturday night sees the Cowboys against the Knights, followed on Sunday by the Bulldogs facing the Sea Eagles. These are sudden death and the winners progress to the semi-finals in week two. Statistically, in 2024, the Cowboys have the best winning record against other top eight teams heading into the NRL finals. But to quote former England footballer and manager Brian Clough, we had the best team on paper, but unfortunately the match is played on grass. That's Pacific Waves for today. For all episodes, head over to rnz.co.nz forward slash Pacific. We're also on Spotify, Apple and iHeartRadio. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, tofa suifu.